Hi everyone. What you are about to watch is a discussion between myself and Luke Stokes. Uh, he's someone who, in my opinion, represents the other side of the argument for delegated proof of stake. I have certainly voiced my uh, concerns or arguments uh, against that particular consensus mechanism plenty of times. So to keep myself from being too hypocritical, I thought it would be good to have someone on who represents the other side of that argument. Um, additionally, he has been working on a wallet integration payment solution type thing. I just want you to know this was not a paid promotion. I do not hold any FIO tokens whatsoever. Um, and this definitely, I'm not trying to shill his project. He also just has a lot of input on this cryptocurrency space. So I think this discussion can be very helpful and uh, insightful for many of you. And if you're interested in checking out FIO, that is all on you. I am not in any way endorsing this project or anything. Um, it does exist. And so if you're interested, links can be found down below in the video description. I hope that was a good enough disclaimer for you guys. Uh, but anyway, Way, let's get into it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode. Today, I have a special guest with me, Luke Stokes, uh, someone who I've met through Steam and my activities on Steamit. Uh, we met up at a couple different Steam Fests. Um, so, uh, a crypto friend and someone who actually represents, in my eyes, the other side of the argument for delegated proof of stake. I've definitely been uh, pretty vocal about that for a while now. And uh, to, you know, not be so hypocritical and not be so maximalistic, I guess, um, I think it's a fair way to have both sides of that argument represented. We will also be talking about things like payment solutions and wallet integrations as well, and trying to achieve this mass adoption for cryptocurrencies. So Luke, thank you for uh, joining me today. Heidi, thank you so much for having me. I was actually thinking about, we hung out and we surfed together in Lisbon. How did I forget that? That was the best part. It was awesome. We had a great day. It's actually, I think one of my profile pictures is still the smile of, you know, after surfing, sitting down, I was living in Nashville at the time. I'm in, I live in Puerto Rico now with my wife and three kids, but like the glow of my face was so obvious. Cause like, oh, I got to surf again. That nice. was beautiful. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I've been in the space for about seven and a half years. I'll just kind of do a quick intro. I yeah, yeah, for sure. Super, Let us know. Super passionate about cryptocurrency. I ran a company for actually 10 years, uh, co-founded a company called Foxycart, which is an e-commerce shopping cart system. And so back in 2013, I was trying to get people to accept cryptocurrency. And I was blogging about it. I was talking about it at conferences. I, I gave a talk about how uh, Bitcoin is going to be more disruptive than the internet, you know, back in 2013. Um, my first purchase, I, I, I spent 50 bucks and I got two and a half Bitcoin in January of 2013. And so I've been involved in the space for a long time, but my own perceptions of the space have evolved as well as I saw the block size debate and all that drama and not really seeing the community resolve that and seeing the forks. And then, you know, as you know, as Steam came around in 2016, I was like, oh, wow, here's people actually using, you know, um, distributed ledger technology or blockchain in a way that, you know, they don't have to be super crazy technical. You know, it's the, there's a user interface, they're blogging, they're doing something they understand and they're getting rewarded with it and they can actually use the tokens in a friendly way. And I also liked the idea that the future of the protocol itself could be determined in a voting on chain mechanism. And that's, you know, the, the DPoS model. So I'm looking forward to talking through that, what, why that appealed to me in the wake of seeing years of frustration with the, uh, the, the POW system not having an on-chain mechanism for governance as such. But of course, now you've got user-initiated hard forks and soft forks. We could talk about that if you want. Uh, there's, there's so many interesting things with the consensus mechanisms. And then of course, the Steam Hive divide that we saw, uh, the recent Ravencoin, I just read uh, Tom Black's uh, great article, uh, Tron Black's great article on that. If you haven't read that, I highly recommend it on the whole story of what happened with the Ravencoin uh, fork recently, uh, well, this, the audit, the security vulnerability. So, mm. so many cool things to talk about. I'm very excited to do it. 
Yeah. So yeah, you're definitely coming from a technical background. And so you're definitely going to be highlighting some things that aren't coming from my personal strengths. So definitely will be uh, supplementing uh, my channel in that way. So thank you. But yeah, uh, let's talk a little bit about some uh, some projects that you've been involved with in cryptocurrency, um, like as of today and then also like you know how they have they been doing things you've worked on in the past and what types of projects or solutions do you think you tend to gravitate towards excellent um yeah i kind of leading into getting involved in steam i eventually became a, a block producer there as a witness and then as the eos network was launching as i was getting into more of kind of the delegated proof of stake systems and how it works I got recruited by a couple of different block producers on EOS. I eventually joined EOS DAC, which I'm very, very passionate about DACs and DAOs. And that's a decentralized autonomous. And the C can be either corporation, company, community, consortia, or DAO is just decentralized autonomous organization. And the basic idea is a group of people with a shared goal can actually build their, their agreements on chain in a transparent and mutable way. So they can all have a more equitable way to accomplish things. So it's not the traditional hierarchy that you see with companies or governments or, or organizations traditionally. So I'm very excited about that being really the future of so many things, uh, how we improve governance in the world, how we create equitable uh, kind of reward distribution for value creation. So very excited about that. I've been working with them for two years. And then I sold my company in 2018 to really focus on just the blockchain space completely. So I was doing consulting and advising for a lot of different projects. Really 2018 was probably my most fun year ever, just kind of having a blast. Although I was selling crypto every month to pay for bills, which was not as exciting, you know, and I, you know, I started doing consulting, making some money here and there. Eventually I got, I think in one week, I had like three or four job offers. It was crazy. But I, I just, for me, it's all about cryptocurrency mass adoption. When I look at the financial industry, when I look at the central banking systems, the violence of democide and the governments, I, it's just clear as day. If I want to create a world for my three kids to grow up in, we have to have a completely different system of motivational incentive and finances. And I look at cryptocurrency and blockchain is that solution. And, or at least it might be distributed ledger technology. Maybe it's a, a DAG. I mean, I don't know, but I know we need something better. And it has to be easier to use. The system right now with the way we exchange public keys is extremely dangerous. There's man in the middle attacks, unencrypted QR codes, all these things. And they're just really hard. So, so I feel like I need mass adoption to cryptocurrency for a world I want to live in, that we all want to live in. And we need to make it easier. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to focus time and energy on FIO because I think they're actually uh, doing something like that. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. One thing that is comparable and that is probably more popular, has been around longer, is Pay ID. They've recently had integrations with Brave, BitPay, and Ripple. Um, so what? that's obviously something that I think you guys are comparing uh, FIO to. So how, what are the issues that you see with Pay ID, and how are you uh, coming about um, that approach differently? It was, it was really interesting when Pay ID came out because, you know, they, there was a kind of a pilot program thing going on in Australia that was also called Pay ID that was similar. It's still kind of not super clear if they're the same. I've heard conflicting reports, but it's essentially a ripple backed uh, approach to very similar to what we're trying to do. So prior to Pay ID, we would look at these other ones. They'd say, well, how are you like ENS? How are you like unstoppable domains? Are you like handshake? You like these other things? And we'd always kind of say, well, Kind of, but not really. Like either they're doing DNS, which is fundamentally public. If you understand DNS, you're doing a domain name lookup to a private to a, to a public text record of an IP address, so you can make that mapping from the you know Google.com to whatever your computer needs to connect to the website. Mm -hmm. That's fundamentally public, and we're like we're doing wallet naming. We believe should be private and secure and self-sovereign for one. But the second part was. We're doing so much more than just wallet naming. We're doing routing of value. So that's the FIO requests, the FIO data. The FIO data can be uh, structured data. It could be like JSON or something like that. You can interact with other smart contracts with that data. And because in our perspective, just wallet naming is not enough to solve the usability problems that cryptocurrency has. You have to be able to route value much, much easier. So that has been our kind of like, yeah, we're not really like those. But when Pay ID came out, it's like, oh, hey, that's actually hey, it validates what we're doing. You know, they've got you know, all these people involved. They have a request functionality. They have all these other things. Um, and it's interesting to think whether or not we influence what they were doing. But 
what really concerns me about that, and this really actually concerns me about a lot of aspects of the cryptocurrency space that I've seen for a while, is this trend towards centralization, this trend towards, well, it's okay, you can just put it all on a web server, and that web server at that dot com is going to somehow manage your financial identity. And that's essentially what PayID does. They say, oh, it's decentralized because it's all these different independent web servers. It's like, but when I commit to having, you know, uh, if a domain is, let's say it's Amazon, and I say, I want to have, you know, Luke at Amazon.com as my PayID. Well, what happens when Amazon wants to charge a different fee for that? What happens if they want to censor one of my transactions? You know, mm -hmm. that's not self-sovereign. That's not something I get to control. So the idea being, it, in our opinion, this can only be properly solved for the cryptocurrency community as a blockchain, as something that is, you have the private key, you have control, no one can censor you, no one can change the way you're going to use this. And on top of that, it's, it's, the idea that if it's not, if it's just like, well, it's public and we'll add the privacy later somehow. And if you read the white paper for pay, it's like, well, these are things that we'll solve somehow. And it's like, no, it's actually not in your interest to solve those because you want all that metadata. You want to know what every transaction is coming exactly. through your shopping cart system because you want to sell that data and you want to control people with that data. And this is the idea that no, when a fear request is encrypted between the two parties involved, there's nobody but those two parties that can see that information. And that's how mm -hmm. it should be. And if we're, if we're a, a community that believes in what I thought were the fundamentals of blockchain, you know, privacy, security, self-sovereign, decentralized distributed networks that are, that are solving the Byzantine fault tolerant problem, all these things, then uh, we should be using solutions that are lined up with our values and ideals. Totally. And okay, so I understand uh, the privacy aspect of making it a decentralized uh, domain for uh, the name service of the wallet, but what do you think about this whole concept of having a human readable uh, public address where most people are going to be choosing their name and how does that play effect into making transactions and uh, that kind of tr uh, traceability with your name and being connected to those transactions? I think it's a great question and I think I actually did an essay on this about privacy, identity, and human flourishing, and how they're, they're really connected in that there are aspects of my identity in a voluntary community that I need to be completely public. And it could be a persona. It doesn't have to be Luke Stokes. It could be Skywalker. You know, I use that, mm -hmm. I, that pseudonym quite a bit throughout my life. You know, I have to have that reputation and identity public. So I need to be able to connect with someone I've never interacted with, be with before and say, how can I trust you and do business with you? You know, I, if I don't have a government with guns to come in and say, well, this person wasn't been thrown in jail, so by reputation standards, you can at least know he's not a criminal. You know, if I don't have that, I have to know who the criminals are. I have to know who the good actors and the bad actors are. So there's an aspect of the way I project myself in the reality that has to have a reputation and identity. But there's also an aspect that needs to be absolutely fundamentally private and secure. That is something I control. And so what I like the beauty about this approach is, one, you can create as many you know, few addresses as you want. It doesn't have to be your name. I have Luke at Stokes, I have the Stokes domain, but I think I also have the DAC domain and I could put you know, random string of characters at DAC and that would be the address I give someone for a particular engagement, for example. You can, you can manage it however you like based on the context of what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. And I think that's really important. And it's also important that you know, people think about it this way in terms of even the other solutions like, you know, I don't mean to pick out an ENS, there's a great group of guys there, but if I map an address to like my LukeSoaks.eth, for example, on Ethereum, well, you're going to be able to track that constantly. Every transaction is going to be tracked. Whereas we've designed it with, when you get a FIO address, you get what we call bundled transactions. You basically prepay because nothing on a blockchain can be free. You mm -hmm. prepay your interactions with the blockchain. So you get 100 bundled transactions. And in that, you can remap your addresses with every single transaction, for example. You can have, you can have a, um, and again, those interactions are secure between those two people. But you can have a hardware deterministic wallet that's remapping it every time. Now, the other part of it that we haven't built yet, and we have something called the, uh, and I'm getting into the weeds a little bit here, but we have the, uh, the FIP process, the, the field improvement proposal process, similar to like BIPs and, and other things you have in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And we have already 12 right now that have been written. And number five is about, a significant improvements to the security and privacy of the field protocol. And that would be where 
you can't even know that almost like in a Monero sense, you can't even know Absolutely. one person is interacting with another person. Meaning you wouldn't be able to interact with me unless we had an out of bound communication, exactly. which is where you could get my Luke at Stokes information. And once okay. you had that, you could interact with me. And then I, that's a key exchange. Now I can validate with you who you are and we can then have a private, as far as the blockchain is concerned, interaction, including mm -hmm. all that. So not only could you remap the public addresses, you could even hide the fact that you sent me a request for funds, for example. That's really where we want to go to make it really private and pay ID and others, for example, don't even have that on their roadmap as a solution. And we've already spec'd it out, worked months on the solution that we want to implement. Yeah. I mean, and what you're pointing out too, with like, you know, their motivations and uh, they can say that, you know, they're planning to all they want, but uh, if it really was a priority, it would have been implemented as a, at a fundamental level. So that's definitely- Or, or at least spec'd out, right? Like, yeah. like we did the work to spec it out. It was literally like, do we, do we delay mainnet launch by two or three months? Cause we mm -hmm. launched mainnet in March of this year. It's, it's 2020 as of this recording. Uh, we activated the chain in April. Uh, you know, everything is functioning and live and working. We've got 31 block producers right now. We've got multiple wallets, including Edge and Garda and Scatter and Anchor and Midas Protocol and a slight integration with Trust. We have a bunch of other wallets that are integrating with it. Uh, we have our first uh, uh, exchange listing and we have more coming. So it's like, it's a real thing, but we, we had this plan from the beginning. This is what we're doing and we've done the work to figure it out. When I look at these other solutions, it's kind of like, well, yeah, that's just outside the scope of that. We'll figure it out eventually. It's like, I don't think you will. Because if you don't make privacy fundamentally easy for someone, they don't do it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's this trade-off between usability and privacy. And we don't want to make that trade-off. Yeah. I mean, we've seen that with other privacy coins as well, with like Zcash and PIVX, the, uh, where you have to opt into the privacy. It's like 1% of users are doing that. So even the people who are like in on the privacy aren't even taking that additional step. So that's cool. And, and fundamentally that weakens their privacy, right? Because a lot of those yeah, are like, well, a lot exactly. of the network it's has to do this or else you can just track tool. what's going on, you know? Exactly. Okay. So you mentioned that, you know, you have, we're going to get a little bit into the DPOS conversation and well, okay, before we do that, for those who haven't seen the explainer video for FIO or know at all anything about FIO, um, from my understanding, and you can I'm sure you'll have to correct me, but from my understanding, it's a way to interact with a whole bunch of different cryptocurrency wallets, a whole bunch of different cryptocurrencies using, and accordingly, what I just learned today, either one wallet ID that you created, or you can create multiple ones for different um, situations. And it essentially allows you to interact with a whole bunch of different cryptocurrencies um, in a very easy way. So can you... I am really having a hard time wrapping my head around the fact that this needs a blockchain because um, it says like it um, it uses the wallets that it's already integrated with um, and their blockchain interoperability. Um, and uh, yeah, can you just explain um, why a blockchain is needed for FIO and if you need to correct my understanding of the system, you are free to do so. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think it's a great question. Like when I do consulting and stuff, that's always number one question. Why do you need a blockchain? Why do you need a token to support that blockchain? And why would you, uh, if you do need one, why would you go build your own? You know, why would you just use an existing network? There's thousands of projects out there already. These are the great questions to ask. These are what I push back really hard on as they asked me to consult for the project. And as I started learning more about it and I started realizing their reasonings for what they were doing, and the fundamental needs to solve the usability problem that I have experienced myself for seven plus years, I was like, okay, this is, this makes sense. Like we did a usability study with a couple of hundred people and it was shocking the percentage of people that have lost money because they copied and pasted the wrong cryptocurrency address mm -hmm. or they literally, I think it was seven something percent actually were victims of men in the middle of attack. What that means is essentially you send me a text message and say, Hey Luke, uh, you know, I want that Bitcoin payment we talked about. Here's my Bitcoin address. I'm like, Oh cool. No problem. And I fired off. And then you're like, that wasn't me. Somebody sim swapped me or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. you know, or, or they, they pretend to be you in a telegram or they, you know, they send an email where people, a lot of people don't read it. Email can be spoofed by anybody. You know, if mm -hmm. I reply to the email and you're like, I didn't send this address, then I, then I would know. So the fundamental usability of crypto based on the surveys that were done is horrendous. I've been in this space seven and a half years. 
I still, and I'm a technologist, I majored in computer science at an Ivy League degree. I still get stressed sending crypto. It's when you're sending large amounts and you're like checking every character and you're yeah. looking for the checksum and everything. You're like, oh gosh, but I just copy and pasted three addresses two minutes ago. So now I have to do it three times just to do the right address. And now it's in my buffer. What if my computer's hacked and I just copied and pasted that and like, oh, it's just, it's not where it needs to be. So an analogy I'll use is the internet was around for 10 years prior to the HTTP protocol. The hypertext transfer protocol gave us the World Wide Web, gave us web browsers. You look at adoption for the internet, it went crazy. So as a fundamental answer to the question, we have to improve usability. Okay, cool. I think we agree on that. For mass adoption, have to make all this easier. Can that be done on an individual wallet basis? And I would argue that it can't, just like it can't be done. You, you can't get different web browsers unless they have a shared protocol to talk hmm. and, and how to interact with each other. And this is what we've seen with the evolution of technology protocols. They, they have to get a consortia of agreement of the major players in the space to say, we all agree to do it this way. So it's ubiquitous, the same user experience across the board. And that is really important. You can look throughout history of technology adoption. That's generally what's been happening. Uh, I've talked to Nick Nafik and other people who worked on, for example, SMS. You couldn't used to send text messages to other networks. Well, it's kind of pointless to have text messages if you, if you have to know what you know, network they're on, that, those type of examples. So mm -hmm. fundamentally, there has to be an interoperable solution for this usability problem. A lot of chains have tried to do that within their chain. And then we get back into the crypto tribalism. It's like, well, if everyone just used EOS, it would be fine. It's like, well, okay, fine, great. Yeah, but no, <laughs> people are using Bitcoin, people are using Tezos, people are using, there's so many other chain solutions and communities. They're not gonna just go use your solution, right? So our fundamental position has been, we wanna be you know, agnostic as to the chain you're involved in. And we're gonna go a layer above that on the user experience level. So yes, they, you know, I can copy and paste addresses and use QR codes and things like that with the current wallets, but it's a stressful experience. Whereas if I have a field request and, and I would love to do the demo, I, I forgot to talk about this, but we could actually do a live demo if you wanted to, mm -hmm. where you could get a field address and I could send you a field request and you could see the experience. It feels so much better. It's like, oh, wow, okay, yeah. Here's $2 being requested and you just slide your finger and boom, boom, okay, sweet. That was really stressless. I know exactly who the payment's going to. I know the exact amount. I know what chain is involved and I have metadata about that transaction that I can refer to later. And it's all private and secure to me, encrypted for me. Hmm. So when it gets to, well, why do you need a blockchain for all that? I, I, being a technologist, when I look at these things, I can't imagine another way to do that in a self-sovereign, secure and private way. And what I mean by that is, it's really important that that mapping is accurate. If you're sending to Luke at Stokes, you better believe I want it to be my Bitcoin address that I control because mm -hmm. your wallet's going to map that. It's going to do a lookup on chain and say, I have the permission to get this Bitcoin address. Yep, you do. Okay, here it is. And then you send the Bitcoin. If we have any centralized actor, such as a government or anyone, a large corporation who could come in and in any way manipulate mm -hmm. that mapping, we have a serious problem. Mm -hmm. So it has to be secure. And that's why you have Handshake, Unstoppable Domains, ENS, like the other people recognize this thing on the wallet naming side, we need to control these mappings. Now, pay ID is kind of, I think, taking an approach where they're like, well, yeah, we can make it verified and secure, but that's not their primary focus. So right now it's open text. And, and even then, that web server, even then, would be a data store of all that information. It's a honeypot of like, if I can hack that information, I can see all your transaction history and all that. Whereas mm -hmm. on a blockchain, individual transactions, it's like, unless the encryption of the entire blockchain breaks, which is obviously not likely, it's just individual accounts that you'd have to hack in order to get access to anything. Mm -hmm. And that's much better distributed security model. So for me, I, I, that's one part of it. The other part of it was, okay, so you might need a blockchain. Why, you know, we went with an EOS IO fork. So it's a, it's a DPoS chain. Why DPoS? Why this technology stack? Because at the time the evaluation was done, they did an evaluation about 15, 20 different blockchains. None of them had the performance we needed. Because again, as a usability solution, that mm -hmm. 500 millisecond block times enables a user experience that's possible. No other chain today can pull that off. Now, yes, you can do that as second layer solutions, but my background with the payment industry, I'm a little concerned with how some of those second layer solutions are being structured. They look very similar to payment gateways, acquirers, 
merchant account providers. And like you start getting these middlemen again. And it's like, wait, wait, I thought we were going away from middlemen and yeah. third party risk. So I, I've said a lot, I, I poke no. the hole and let's poke it, let's go deeper. No, it's great. I mean, um, one thing that you were talking about too uh, in our chats before this talk was uh, governance models. And I was curious to say like, what kind of issues can you see that would require some form of community vote on how uh, the FIO protocol would operate? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think there is no perfect governance model. I have not seen it yet. I've been striving, as I said, for two years in DAX and DAOs, exploring all kinds of different things. Uh, I've been in part of the conversations with Casper Labs as they're working on de developer DAO. Uh, reputation staking pools is really very, very fascinating ideas. Wolf and others have been writing papers and books on that. Uh, I've seen proof of stake, delegated proof of stake. I've seen proof of work and I've seen challenges with all of them. You know, we were just talking about the, the Ravencoin uh, exploit that happened recently. I was just reading that all last night. You know, there's no secure system. Any, any good security technologist will tell you no system is perfect. There's just some that are harder to take down than others, right? Mm -hmm. And the same thing for Bitcoin. You know, thankfully, Bitcoin has a ton of security. But you'd also, there are arguments that, and, and some of them by very credible people, some of them by people people like to yell at. <laughs> but there are some credible people that say Bitcoin has been kind of pushed a different direction, let's say, than originally intended. You know, and mm. there's that argument that goes on. So there are multiple ways to take over a network. Sometimes it's a long play. You eventually yeah. kind of get more and more influence on the, the code changes that happen over time. And it's like boiling the frog really slowly. There's mm -hmm. some people who think that those type of things are happening. So I think as, as it relates to FIO, I'm not convinced that delegated proof of stake as it exists in the EOS IO technology stack is, you know, the best solution. I think it's a very interesting one. I think I've seen some very uh, contentious challenges solved very quickly in both the Steam, Hive, and EOS networks that I'm very happy with because in the Bitcoin, again, two, three years of infighting leading to a massive fork of Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core, um, I just felt wasn't as effective to develop user experiences that are uh, very useful that my, you know, anyone can figure out. We have to evolve very, very quickly, even more so as we reach, you know, a singularity and exponential adoption of cryptocurrencies and technologies. We have to be able to move very quickly. And it's a feature and a bug to have so much security that you can't fix things or evolve quickly, right? Yeah. So I think an example would be, as I mentioned, the FIPS, the, the FIO improvement proposals. Mm -hmm. We're currently doing those on GitHub. So basically someone submits a proposal and they say, here's the changes I want to make to the protocol. We debate it and discuss it with the community of block producers and community members in Telegram. I discuss it if I have to with the board, which is a, there is actually a board on the foundation, the nonprofit Cayman entity. And the idea being eventually, as we get further along and mature the protocol, I want to build the DAX software that I've been working on for two years with EOS DAX into the fundamental nature of what the foundation is. So mm -hmm. the token holders, based on Cayman law, can't officially vote up, you know, the board members, but they can create, certainly vote in a list to say current board members that are legal part of this entity, we'd like you to select who, who should be on the board from this list. They can then pick their board. Now the board members have zero say in the actual protocol. That's still delegated proof of stake. It's still, you know, stake weighted elected block producers, but they have the opportunity to participate in guidance and leadership, which I think you could argue EOS mainnet has not had. And it's mm -hmm. been detriment to their community because they've been so decentralized and, and block one has not participated at all. But at the same time, you know, we have to be very careful how that organization is run. You experienced Mr. Ned Scott and, and all that drama on Steam as the rest of us did. Mm -hmm. And when we have a, a central actor with too much influence, specifically if the the voting rights, uh, that's a, a significant problem as well. So I look at all of this as experiments in governance and experiments in decentralization and distribution and distributed systems. And we have to keep innovating. It, it, it's, I think it's really just frankly hubris and a little bit of arrogance when I hear the cryptocurrency community being like, we've figured it all out. And it's like, yeah, you're less than 1% of the world. Like nobody exactly. cares what you're doing right now. You're like <laughs> yeah. a fraction of the percentage of like the richest people on the planet, like one dude, right? So come on guys, let's mm -hmm. have a little humility and recognize we have a lot of problems left to solve and they're going to take a lot of experimentation to solve them. And no one person or one protocol or one, you know, tribalistic approach is going to do it.
Yeah, no, that's great. And that's exactly why um, I was happy to have you on this channel is that perspective. So we all experience, you know, the drama, like you said, with Steam It and the um, voting power with that huge bag of coins involved. And there was some rumors of collusion happening on EOS. Uh, with this new blockchain, like what have you designed to try to avoid talking about, you know, it problems and trying to pursue better solutions? What have you, have you considered that or done anything um, to that effect of trying to organize uh, the governance model or the voting model to be uh, better? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's been many extensive conversations with both when before when I was a consultant with DAPIX and then when, when later I got asked to participate at a, at a larger level as far as the managing director for the foundation. It's the, the question of governance. And one of the things that it took a shift in my mind to one, agree to and then further actually appreciate and recognize the value of. And that's the idea that FIO is a decentralized autonomous consortia. So it's actually designed and intended to be a group of industry leaders. So mm -hmm. like we have like a, a trade group or something like that, you have kind of all the major players. So in EOS and other places, in the, in initially there was a huge pushback for, for example, exchanges running their own validator nodes and being block producers and saying, oh, that's collusion, you know, and they're, they're, they're selling votes, for example, those type of things. Mm -hmm. Whereas with FIO, the idea was, and we actually want the exchanges to be block producers. We want the wallets to be block producers. We want the main industry leaders to be block producers because unlike these other situations, they're actually integrating, ideally, the protocol into their user experience that creates the revenue for them. So mm -hmm. if the blockchain is not functioning at the peak high performance, if they're using, you know, some crappy node and just trying to get, you know, collect validator rewards, uh, it's going to impact the revenue stream of their company. But the deposit and withdraw area for an exchange is radically improved if you do it through a FIA request. It eliminates all, you know, so many of their customer support requests where they're like, oh, I sent my Bitcoin cash to a Bitcoin address. Please help me get it back. You know, so much of that drama is just like, oh, it just shows up on my phone, deposit, there it is. Yep, boom, done. Super, mm. super simple. Mm. And so it's different in that we are embracing that consortium model where these are going to be the industry leaders as validators. And the idea being that they are the ones with skin in the game to ensure that the network is efficient and effective and runs really, really well. Mm. That's, that's the theory anyway. That's what we're operating under. And it's really up to the community of cryptocurrency influencers and projects, people like yourself to say, hey guys, do we care about usability? Yes, we do. Okay. Do we have a plan to get there? That's mm. self-sovereign, private, secure, uh, you know, it's decentralized, not centralized. And if the answer is crickets and nobody cares, well, it's like, all right, well, I guess we'll check back in a few years. But ultimately, if they say, yeah, yeah, we really need to do this. It's really difficult right now. I try to explain Bitcoin to my friends and, and they just, you know, the first time they send crypto, they're freaking out. They're stressed out. Well, that can't be the daily experience of someone paying their bills if this is now the new normal, right? So we have to solve this. How are we going to solve it? And, and I feel like this is one of the best solutions on the table right now. Yeah. And as always, it is an experiment and it's either going to work or it's not. And either way, you're going to learn from it. And I know people like you are just going to keep on going anyway, because uh, like you said, you want to build the world that we what, want it to be. So absolutely. What, what else am I going to do? I think about this sometimes when the, when the, when the days are challenging and you're like, man, this technology is so hard to work with, you know, like with, with EOS DAC, the EOS mainnet, for example, had, uh, had some issues with signing multi-sigs and deferred transactions. And was like, oh, we can't even get our DAC to approve proposals because the main, you know, the network's having challenges. And then I see, you know, Ethereum gas prices are way too high and all the DACs and DAOs and games and everything people are excited about just usability usage just drops because it's too expensive, you know? And, and I see these things and I'm like, ah, oh, man, am I, have I just been kidding myself this whole time for seven and, plus, seven and a half years that we're changing the world, you know? We're gonna make the world a better place. I'm gonna create something better for my kids. Am I kidding myself here? And in those moments, I, I you know, I take a breath, do some, do some consciousness awareness and be like, okay, all right, what else would I be doing? What other game in town has the potential to unlock freedom that has, you know, global, non-violent consensus you know this is what blockchain gives us and we have a mechanism via the tokenomics to create incentives that we can secure those networks in a way that's fully decentralized there's going to be nobody to be able to come in and say well I'm, i don't like what you're doing it's a threat to my power i'm going to take you over 
Mm -hmm. So it's the, the, the token price of these projects matters also, you know, it's like, that's actually the reward for the validators to secure the network. So there's a part of it that is like, okay, we also have a responsibility as a community to support the projects we believe in. We can't just be in this whole like speculative perspective forever. We have to kind of say, okay, eventually, you know, as, as Buffett talks about when tide goes out, you know, who's skippy dipping, you know, is it, which of these <laughs> fundamental projects have value for our community and how are we going to support yeah, yeah, fair point. That's one thing I, I'm always kind of, uh, I mean, it's like you want to get this usability aspect is like the fine tuning of like the cryptocurrency space. But at the same time, like you just said, when we get these influx of users or whatever, new exciting things on Ethereum or whatever, gas prices skyrocket, scalability is uh, haunting nearly every majorly used blockchain. So it's like, um, yeah, there's still big issues to be uh, addressed also at the same time. It's like, um, it's a huge experiment. It's many different yeah, moving pieces. I, I would say that I think one of the fundamental challenges we probably have, and you've been in this space for a while as well, it's this bubble of like, oh, usability is just kind of the polish, right? But HTTP was fundamentally needed for the internet to happen. The internet was around mm -hmm. for 10 years. And yeah, there were, you know, academics and universities and some government agencies using it. But without that worldwide web, web browser experience where they're like, oh, I get it. This is how TCP IP and all the, you know, all these, you know, FTP and, you know, all, SMTP, how these protocols work together to create eventually what we're using right now, you know, having this, this streaming call or Netflix or Gmail yeah. or whatever these really amazing experiences as an industry, I hope we kind of grow up and recognize we have to treat ourselves seriously like a technology industry that other institutions and organizations can look at and say, Oh, you guys have grown up. You actually understand the user experience and how we need to provide a really good one. And you've understood, uh, you know, what our actual pain points are. We're not helping humans, you know, with a better experience, then what's the point, right? If technology doesn't do that, it doesn't solve real problems, then it's kind of pointless. Exactly. Yeah. And but there there is one major difference, I think, between the invent advent of the internet and cryptocurrencies, maybe. I'm sure there was, you know, some people threatened with the uh, freedom of information that the internet provided, but the idea of cryptocurrency and them being sovereign and you know borderless and that's that's threatening for a lot of big people so um yeah <laughs> um, definitely and, and not only that it's it's one of those things where as as innovators in the space we have to be very careful that's why privacy you know, and decentralization should be so highly valued because it will be tested <laughs> the tide will go out and there will be a lot of people skinny dipping for sure and, and as well i as someone who believes in these values i have to step back and say you know there's conversation about oh we can we can use the field protocol for the travel rule and i know how you feel about kyc and all that on centralized exchanges and that's kind of like oh you can i don't know how i feel about that but mm -hmm. if it's gonna happen anyway which it is would I prefer it to be a centralized service that I don't get to control my data? Or would I prefer it to be on a blockchain where I get to selectively decide back to our conversation about privacy and radical transparency, that I get to decide who I trust and who I want to give my personal data to. So then mm -hmm. I, I can actually control that myself, you know? So it's, it's, it's an area that is really challenging as far as compromise. There's another piece too that I think is interesting back to your question about governance and what FIO has done. Um, we see on these other networks where the centralized actors get all the control, especially if they're holding, you know, especially the, um, when they're holding the tokens of someone else, when they're, I'm forgetting the word. Uh, Delegating or? Uh, where, where you, uh, where you're holding the private key for someone else, your- uh, Oh, custody? Custody, thank you. I was totally <laughs> dropping that word. So when you're doing a, when you're a custody solution, especially a centralized custody solution, holding the private keys for other, you know, not your keys, not your coins, you get all the power in when those coins are part of voting. Mm -hmm. What we did with Theo you know, as part of the default protocol, if you are a decentralized wallet or a decentralized exchange, every interaction with the Theo protocol and all the tokens that are interacting with your interface has what's called a TPID, a technology provider ID, and essentially you get to vote with those tokens in a decentralized way. 
So now the decentralized solutions get as much influence of the governance as the centralized solutions, unless the user goes in and votes themselves and you know, sets a different proxy or sets a different set of votes manually. By default, my usage of a product gives them the right to have say over the protocol, which we think is really exciting because in theory, that should create a meritocracy where the best product, even if it just showed up yesterday, the very best user experience starts to win people's votes by usage. So I start moving my FIO tokens, for example, into that wallet. I start using that wallet because it's just such a better experience. I'll start using that decentralized exchange because I care about you know, privacy and security and self-sovereign control. And all of a sudden, they have way more influence on who gets to be a validator on the network. And mm -hmm. that little change there, though it may seem insignificant, I think is really important because it gives the decentralized solutions more of a say than they're getting now. And it fights that trend towards centralization, meaning, oh man, I get more staking rewards or whatever, whatever, when I move to the largest mining pools or I lose to the, move to the largest centralized stakers. So I, I, those little things that we did and we hope to continue to do will help move towards decentralization more and more. Well, yeah, and it's a lot actually like what we're seeing with this whole DeFi space and like uh, liquidity mining and how that is incentivizing more usage on decentralized exchanges, with, which I think is great. And it seems like a small thing, but that's literally all that they probably need to get just that little spark going of the network effect and getting more users on it. And um, yeah, like that's, I would love for more people to wake up to... Uh, avoiding KYC and making themselves vulnerable in so many different ways. Um, and yeah, so it is interesting, this whole, yet again, another experiment of tokenization, of incentivizing usage. And um, bottom line is if you also have a user experience that matches with it, it's like, that's, you're golden. So I did want to talk, I had a question for you, uh, going back to delegated proof of stake and this idea of um, voting. And, you know, you say like proof of work is definitely, there's the, obviously the advantage for a delegated proof of stake is that changes can be made relatively quickly because there is a smaller number of, uh, of, of validators. Um, but the thing that I keep thinking about with delegated proof of stake is that all you need to vote is to buy a coin. That doesn't mean that you're necessarily qualified to ascribe an appropriate vote for whatever or even know what you're voting for. Um, so that's something that, like I just keep thinking it's like if you don't know any better, if you're not really invested in it, but you vote for whatever reason, most likely you're going to be voting for someone who has like the best marketing scheme. And it's kind of like that turns into the politics of today, um, like in the US or whatever. So how what are your thoughts on like uh, the quality of votes that you get with delegated proof of stake versus like if you're running a full node on proof of work, you have to know the technical backgrounds of it. You're maintaining that node. Um, you're probably paying a lot more attention to like the repercussions of, uh, you know, which way you're signaling. Um, and similar for proof of stake, you have to invest quite a lot of quite a bit of money usually to be a validator, uh, to be able to stake coins. Um, so, you know, you're naturally going to be a bit more invested, but something like delegated proof of stake where, um, you know, like one coin, one vote or whatever, like, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, there's a lot of good questions. Uh, I'll unpack it as best I can. <laughs> you're exactly right that all of this is as we've been talking about an experiment in governance, and there's a lot of different ways to approach it. Uh, as I said, I just was reading about the Ravencoin situation and it's a fast, it's a 30 minute read, but it's a fascinating read. I highly recommend it mm -hmm. because it talks about how, and, and I know he's gotten some flack about it a bit, but he talks about how when Bitcoin had similar issues, like in 2018, when they had a major serious issue, but they kind of snuck it into the mining pools and got people to upgrade quick enough for it to not be a problem or back even way further than that early in the project, it was 2010 or so, where it just totally uh, you know, blew up with all these tokens and they were able to you know, pull them back. Mm -hmm. And then I remember in 20, it was either 2013, 2014, I think it was 2013, where they had a fork and they you know, had two different chains because they pushed out, and this was back to the block size problem, they had a, a version of the wallet that allowed a larger block and another version that didn't. Mm -hmm. And they had, you know, and I remember standing up to two, three in the morning watching it happen in IRC in real time. 
And when they solved it, when they came together as a community, I remember telling my wife, I was like, this is going to change the world. This is the most amazing thing ever. These global uh, people all over the world uh, that are actually like, you know, competing in some level, we're, we're individually selfishly motivated to do what's in the best interest of everyone else. <laughs> yeah, I, saw that. Great, I was yeah. like, whoa, that's amazing, right? <laughs> and they, they did, they, they shut down their mining pools, they shut down their, 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 their companies so they could fix the problem. So I, I've always been interested in human motivational psychology, kind of the intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, what drives us to do what we do. And I think all of these consensus algorithms at their core are tied to that. You know, why do you run a full node and pay the electricity costs and, and mm -hmm. set all that up and do all the training? It's because you care about your stake in that network. You want to secure it. You want to make sure that your Bitcoin's worth something tomorrow and doesn't get hacked, right? Mm -hmm. why, do you, why do you buy that token? Why do you transfer, you know, your, your time and energy away from your family to go work a job into tokens that you can stake to secure the network, right? These are all part of the conversation. And I think for when it comes to DPoS and the idea, and even proof of stake as well, where it's like, is it, it I love Nassim Taleb's uh, skin in the game. I think it's yeah. a really great way to think about this problem because why is government failing? The people involved don't have skin in the game. Why yeah. is academia failing? The people involved don't have skin in the game. Why is the health, uh, industry failing more and more. It's because of the way we've done lobbying and insurance and regulation, those people don't have skin in the game either. It's like, oh, I'll charge you this amount, but really I don't know what's actually happening, you know, who's getting paid what, and the doctors don't even know. It's insane. Yeah. So when we look at these failed systems, it's all of lack of skin in the game. So although, you know, delegated proof of stake and proof of stake is just a, uh, some argue a plutocracy, it's like whoever has the most money gets to make all the rules. Although that's, you know, a version of the skin in the game, is it, is, is, the, is it the best one? Mm -hmm. So my answer to that has essentially been, when I go to a conference and I give a talk and I raise, you know, hey, raise your hand if you run a full node. Mm -hmm. And crickets. Maybe one person, maybe yeah. two. Just, yeah. we talk about this being a decentralized distributed network, but that's the reality of it. Now, if I raise my hand and say, how many of you have ever voted for a block producer? If you're like in an EOS crowd, you mm -hmm. might get every hand up. Now, individually, maybe they don't have a whole lot of say, but if you add up all their wallets, plus all the private ones nobody knows about, right? You can actually get some significant influence on the protocol itself. Now, mm -hmm. to your question about, well, how good are those votes? I totally agree with you. If, you. if you're technically smart enough to run a full node, you're freaking awesome and you're on point and you're signaling you know, your bips of what's gonna happen at certain block heights and all that, fan freaking tastic that's awesome. I, I hope for a day where, you know, sitting on my desk, I've got my little full node box that's super plug and play and it just runs and, you know, it sends me a message saying, hey, there's a new vote next week. How are you going to vote? Oh, okay, I'll vote this way. Thanks for all the pros and cons. Boom, I'm done. You know, mm -hmm. that's not a reality we have. But with DPoS, you have the ability to at least connect with a proxy. And so that's similar to mining pools, right? You, you say, mm -hmm. well, I'm not going to figure it all out. Here's my hashing power. I trust you. You go figure it out. And, and some of the critiques that I've heard from the DPoS community to the proof of work community is like, oh man, you know, they, they can't, you know, it, it's just as centralized. And I'm like, no, they can move your hashing power just like you can move your vote, right? And, and you've got proxies just like a mining pool, right? The proxy does all the deep research and you pick from which proxy you like most. But what I do think is a challenge is the kind of, well, what are you going to give me if I vote for you? You know, what's the, the buying and selling of votes, the reward aspect of a proxy is a concern to me. And I fought against that happening for quite some time and frankly lost. I mean, even block one and others are like, man, this is just the way it's gonna be. Hmm. And as I've been integrating with Theo and thinking about this decentralized autonomous consortia, thinking about having the major players involved, I'm opening my eyes a little bit more to say, okay, ultimately, what are the goals? Super secure network. You know, the more money that gets involved in that, the more secure the network's going to be. And especially if people are, you know, their interaction with it is, oh, it's so easy. I just do this. And it's going to be new people coming in and they're not going to know what a public address is or what a your private, like, or let alone, let alone knowing how to look at a block explorer <laughs> and whatever that is. Like, yeah, I'd say security with, as the ease of use comes in also comes trust. And with that, I think, yeah, obviously security is a huge concern for something like that. Yeah, usability is a really big deal. And I, I wish more technologists, myself included, you know, focused on that and really thought about what are we doing to make this 
something that can actually improve people's lives. You know, if we're not doing something that's easy and, and Steve Jobs figured this out, you know, there's certain people that we can look to and say, they really got this, you know, a single mm. little button made a lot of sense as opposed to all these widgets and dials and cranks. And they did that. If you kind of dive a little deeper, they did that because they were people really fascinated by consciousness and awareness and like, yeah. why are we here? What are we doing? You know, that's they their whole advertising campaign. Like, yeah, exactly. It's like, we have to know who am I and why am I here? What am I doing? How am I improving the world? And, and what does that experience of consciousness look like? And I think that's, if we had everybody doing that on in their own special ways, I think we'd see a lot of improvement in the world pretty quickly. Mm, yeah. Well, this has been a great talk. I hope that we covered everything that you wish to cover. Um, but uh, I don't want to keep, it's been an hour. That's amazing. Um. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I certainly don't want to be the guy who gets on, on your show and shows a project, but I do want to say like, I believe in FIO because I believe that the blockchain industry needs massive usability concerns. And I want those to be private, self-sovereign, secure, and decentralized. And so if you believe in that also, I would appreciate you taking a look. It's FIOprotocol.io. Uh, if you want a fee, free FIO address, we have multiple campaigns going with our different wallets. And, and just let us know what you think about it. Watch the explainer video, see the demos, see the e-commerce demo. We even have a store where you can buy some, you know, if you want a little Bitcoin COVID mask, you can buy a mask with a FIO request. I'd like to hear from people about this. I'm Luke Stokes on Twitter. I'm Luke Stokes on Telegram. I'm Luke Stokes on Hive. Uh, I'd love to hear people's reaction to this. Do they care? Because if they don't care, then you know maybe years from now, somebody else will do a usability solution and it'll work and everyone will adopt it and get excited. But I'm hoping and I'm betting with the time and attention I put into this, that people do care about this stuff. And so I, I'd love for you to check it out. It's just fioprotocol.io. Awesome. Thank you again, Luke, for all of your information, your opinions and uh, your input. Uh, it's been great. So uh, yeah, thank you again for being on my show and we will be in touch. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it.